So uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about developer experience, how it's central to DevOps success. Uh, I also have a bunch of AI gener generated images. Uh, they are not nearly as cool. Um, and the choice of otters for developers, I think, was amazing. And uh, yeah, so I might have to do that myself. But uh, yeah, some of them are going to be quite interesting. Hopefully, they talk. You know, they get across the idea of DevOps and DevX and other things. So AI overlords to the rescue. Okay, so uh, yeah, when we think about like developer experience, um, it from the simplicity of that kind of setup process uh, to the complexity of solving the production issues, like they talked about uh, of that kind of setup process, direct, uh, developer experience really does directly impact uh, developer productivity, their satisfaction, uh, ultimately the quality of the products uh, that they're going to build and use. Now, DevX really is uh, you know, it's, it's not a new thing. Uh, we've been concerned about it as an industry for a long time. It just kind of has bubbled up with uh, other things. Uh, but it is definitely an integral part of the entire development life cycle. It's not just, uh, you know, one early piece. Uh, it is a direct result also of the choice of the development tools, the technologies, the platforms that you're going to use as an organization. So that means, you know, the ease of use, uh, reliability, how accessible and understandable that documentation is, how efficient uh, your build processes are processes are going to be, uh, the effectiveness of the certain testing t uh, frameworks that you use, uh, how the smoothness of your deployment procedures, all of those things have an impact on you know, the overall developer experience for both you know, internal teams and for those that might be using your product and or service that you have. Now, uh, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I am a co-founder, DevX consultant. I have a thing I'm kind of trying to start up. I've also been uh, in DevOps and uh, tech industry for uh, quite a long time, 30 years. I started when I was three. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the blue hair is to hide a lot of gray, uh, but not in the beard because that didn't, would look weird. Anyways, uh, we're going to get into it. So, again, what is DevX? Now, they had a great definition. Um, I'm going to start with kind of my uh, kind of way of looking at it is really it's kind of the journey of developers as they learn and deploy technology. Uh, when successful, it, it really focuses on eliminating those obstacles that are going to hinder them, uh, a developer or a practitioner, from uh, achieving success in their endeavors, what they're trying to do. Now, it is really about every interaction a developer has with the systems, tools, and processes. We've all probably seen this, this uh, uh, what it means to be a product manager sometimes. Uh, the same type of experience a developer can have is that if it doesn't fit exactly what they're trying to do, it can be a, a pain. Um, I'm sure we could all think of a tool or a service, uh, which we've had a positive experience, uh, as well as one that we've had uh, probably a negative experience as well. Um, if you haven't seen this, I, I need to really provide the link to it. The whole whole TikTok it originally was on YouTube. The whole thing is really quite hilarious. We don't have all the time. But thinking about a tool and a service, here's one uh, kind of a, a, a way of doing things that I want to kind of dive into. A great example of uh, kind of this idea of developer experience and how it's changed the industry uh, that is the evolution of integrated developer environments. Um, IDEs, as we now call them, because it's too many words to use all the time. Uh, prior to the 90s, uh, you mostly had text-based editors uh, used to write code, like VI, which I guess, according to this uh, here, we were supposed to call it six, uh, which is probably a whole lot easier. Um, but it was created in 1976, uh, included, and it was included in the first BSD Linux release. Uh, then we had Emacs in 1985, uh, Vim in 91, uh, which... Uh, you know, there's opinions on that, just like tabs and spaces. Uh, but my personal favorite is Nano. Uh, probably, I mean, that, of course, came in, out in 99, but it's probably my favorite because I don't have to replace my computer every time I enter Vim. Uh, I can just easily exit, and it works just great. And I can save the, you know, save the environment one computer at a time without using Vim. You, too, could also transition. Uh, but one of the first IDEs that had a plug-in concept was HP SoftBench. Who happens to remember HP SoftBench? Uh, gosh, only me. Um, it was released in 1989. Uh, it was one of the first plug-in IDEs that evidently shipped with its own library. Uh, and uh, it was extensively talked about in the June 1990 edition of the HP Journal, uh, which is a fascinating read because the HP literally lays out uh, this kind of landscape of what they think software development is going to become and the tools and the processes and procedures. They talk about uh, automated testing, distributed computing, uh, integrated and interchangeable tools, and so much more was talked about in 1989. 
uh, and HP Softbench was the thing that they said this was going to catapult it. It was a, a plugin, uh, plugin driven IDE. Uh, the link is there. Uh, obviously, you can't click it on the screen, um, but I will be posting those. And uh, yeah, definitely highly recommend reading that that whole uh, journal. Uh, Early reviews of IDEs uh, came out in uh, 1995. The German version of Computer Week uh, said that um, the use of an IDE was not well received by developers since it would fence in their creativity. That was in 1995. Uh, yeah. Uh, a few native IDEs followed after that, uh, kind of came in and out in the mid 80s, not really followed, but we had some native ones that came out in the 1980s uh, with Turbo Pascal. Probably some more, we're starting to remember some of these. Uh, Apple's Macintosh Programmers Workshop was also a native way of building Mac apps in 1986. Borland Delphi, uh, anyone remember Borland Delphi? Okay, good. Uh, Do you know that it's still around? Uh, Embarcadero Delphi, uh, they purchased it in version 12 is out. It's actually still a thing people use to do uh, kind of some cross-platform development. I, I was shocked when I found that out. Uh, I thought it was gone for good. Uh, but uh, the web uh, really accelerated kind of what we think about uh, like development environments now. Um, in the uh, launch of the World Wide Web uh, in the early 1990s, uh, IDEs became more graphical. Uh, who remembers the first uh, HTML WYSIWYG editor? Anyone use uh, Silicon Graphics Web Magic? That was released in January of 1995. It was built in 90 days and released. Um, the story on that is, is fascinating. I'll have to link to that story. Um, what followed soon after that, or in, in October, uh, Microsoft was not to be outdone. They brought out FrontPage. I'm sure a lot of us also remember FrontPage and have all of the battle wounds and the, the scars and yeah. Um, but in order to do that, they actually acquired it from a company called Vermeer, <laughs> was in order to actually get into the game. That was in 95. Uh, Dreamweaver. Uh, they, that came out, it kicked out, started a whole lot more of those that were around like feature, feature and uh, a lot of usability things started to hop in. Uh, Macromedia actually acquired an app called Backstage from iBand in 1996, changed it to be Dreamweaver and eventually Backstage came back in something else. Uh, but it was also awesome. Who remembers Dreamweaver? Whoever used, yeah, like that's, like it was the first, one of the first that really had all these custom controls and uh, libraries you could use and, and different different scripts and integrations and such. And so much of that was community driven. If you ever went onto the Macromedia at the time for all of their tools then, had such a big community driven things, uh, that, was, that was one of the first to do that. Um, Front page 2000 saw the inclusion of you know plugins. There was front page server extensions, uh, so you could manage the web easier just from from that. Uh, NetBeans uh, that was released in 2000 for Java. Uh, IntelliJ Eclipse came out around that same time. Um, Visual Studio started to offer like all this enhanced functionality uh, with sophisticated features like you had intelligent code uh, completion, which first appeared uh, then. Uh, refactoring tools, improved improved version control things. Um, we saw a noticeable increase in support for multiple languages in an IDE instead of having to have a you know version of it for Eclipse and a version of this for like it was now you could you'd have multiple inside of those. Uh, we also saw a lot more lightweight IDEs start to come out, uh, which uh, there was Sublime Text, uh, which is still around. Uh, Atom uh, was had kind of a short lived, but that was really kind of a a kickstart into what ultimately, and not ultimately became, but a kickstart into this idea of you know doing an open, a lot more open uh, code gener or code IDEs uh, with Visual Studio Code kind of came out. Uh, all of those focused on like the speed, user friendly interfaces, extensive plugin ecosystems, catering to a broader range of uh, developers by being less resource intensive, uh, and they're more customizable, so it could be used for a lot of different things. In, in the themes and everything just explodes from there. Uh, then we saw, have seen, you know, cloud-based IDEs now. Uh, the introduction you had like AWS Cloud9, uh, Gitpod, uh, there's GitHub Codespaces. They've all kind of revolutionized kind of the way that we kind of think about fully configured development environments uh, to, uh, in the cloud, accessible from anywhere, uh, reducing the need for kind of having a lot of complex kind of local things. You can make it easier for people to start uh, working on uh, maybe it's working on documentation or maybe it's working on websites for a company or within an organization. It's just made it a whole lot easier with, with things like this. So we went from, uh, we kind of went from this, um, whoops. Yeah, we went from this, 
where you know IDEs is going to make it's going to fence in our creativity uh, to now things like this that all do all this stuff for us. They have it all included. It's kind of that evolution of uh, a better developer experience uh, along the way. Um, who remembers having to FTP your files? Yeah, gosh. And, and I'm not. Even, I didn't even mention Visual Source Safe in any of that because I I didn't really want to bring any more nightmares than we already have. Uh, anyways, so I go through all of this here to kind of really illustrate how this overall developer experience that we kind of sought out as an industry, uh, we've seen through software development has really in, evolved over time, um, leading to where we sit now with, with IDEs. Uh, things we didn't know we needed back in the 1960s you know, is now commonplace in the, 19, in the 2020s. We're in the 21st century now. Um, modern development, you know, the, the IDE is really just that one example of the significant strides that we've made in uh, improving the overall developer experience. Um, you know, the certain developer ex uh, experience strategies have evolved to meet a lot of the contemporary development challenges and opportunities that we see. Uh, you know, from your basic kind of manually configured environments to sophisticated cloud-based uh, automated setups that were just, you know, talked about. Uh, the journey reflects really this relentless pursuit of efficiency, usability, and developer productivity. Uh, another quick example when you think about that piece uh, is the setup of, you know, a lot of environments. Um, in the early days, you used to be that uh, you had to set up an environment involved really manually configuring each tool and library and dependency and uh, which really was uh, time consuming, very error prone, because humans were not really good at uh, repetitive uh, actions. And so, you know, developers, there was always, often this struggle around uh, version conflicts, compatibility issues, uh, different tools, libraries kind of uh, reared their ugly heads. Uh, so, in the mid late 90s, uh, systems like CF Engine and CF Engine version 2 uh, emerged to automate this process. Whoever used CF Engine? Okay, a couple, good. Uh, advent of tools like Puppet and Chef and SaltStack and Ansible, all of those allowed for this automated kind of setup and configuration of those environments and, and of other processes, uh, reducing a lot of that manual effort. Then we saw Docker uh, in 2013, and that like just completely uh, like changed the way we did a lot of these deployments. It was a significant shift. Now you could package applications uh, with all their dependencies in the containers and ensuring consistency across environments, which we which we had in some ways before. But Docker provided a way to do it much simpler and much quicker, and with a lot more uh, control. We've seen tools like Terraform, CloudFormation, have enabled developers really to find their infrastructure through code, making you know, the setup reproducible, scalable. Um, ID environments with CDI pipelines uh, and DevOps practices have really kind of streamlined that whole process, allowing you know, for faster and more reliable builds and deployments. So just as with IDEs, we've seen this broader uh, impact of developer experience on uh, DevOps itself. Things like how we deploy software, infrastructure's code, developer efficiencies, uh, and a whole lot more we don't have enough time in a 20 minute talk to go through. Uh, so when we think about a good, like good, dev, uh, good DevOps is really found in having good developer experience. And they're both very, very interchangeable when you start to really put these kind of, a lot of these practices together. Uh, it's facilitating you know, smoother transitions between your devs and ops teams, removing some of those silos, uh, minimizes bottlenecks. Uh, the feedback loops, like that's such, feedback loop is such an important part of uh, a good developer experience as well as DevOps uh, and DevRel and you know, communities, all these things all boil into that. Um, and, you know, having a, a positive experience, make sure that all those loops are they're efficient, they're productive, uh, and, you know, um, all of that stuff kind of helps DevOps principles actually kind of take hold within a, an environment, uh, within a, a company. Uh, uh, at its core uh, really does align perfectly with what kind of DevOps is. It really is that combination of practices and tools designed, uh, you know, to increase an organization's ability and this, uh, to deliver application services faster than traditional software development processes. That's, a, that's my definition of DevOps. Um, a few of kind of these core principles that were even touched on with uh, previous talk uh, really kind of bring a lot of this together. Uh, principles of collaboration in DevOps is really about creating that environment where teams are able to uh, break down those silos and have a lot of um, good functionality through cross-functional uh, cross teams to work as a single unit. It's kind of culture first and then looking at the tools and processes second. 
uh, when DevX and, and DevOps are really aligned, we enhance that collaboration. You see tools now that, that help you get there, but you need to be, have that culture first before those tools are really gonna take form, uh, kind of take root within. Uh, the backbone of DevOps is, is effective communication. Uh, and you know, that's make sure that all members of, the, of your dev, your ops, your, all the different stakeholders, broader organization teams, they're all out on the same page of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and so when, with that improved communication, you start to see a lot more, uh, your info sharing and feedback is gonna be a lot more streamlined because now you have you know, things like your, your CITD pipelines, your shared dashboards, automated alerting systems are all part of this way that you can communicate so that everybody uh, is clued in and has a visibility into that development process. Uh, they can easily see those updates, share them, quickly address issues instead of having to wait to hear from someone else. Uh, and a shared responsibility is one of the other principles of DevOps. Uh, that really is that collective uh, responsibility uh, for software's quality and reliability, blurring those lines that have for many years were all about like, well, that's my job. Uh, I do the code, I throw it across and you deal with it. That's you know, your job, not mine. Uh, but it really moves to this kind of, we're all this in this together. Everybody has that shared responsibility where success and failures are shared. Uh, and that brings empowerment to all of the team, uh, that they are going to know that they have the same access in, to tools and information to contribute. Uh, when we democratize uh, access to the tools and systems and information, uh, this kind of DevX idea of um, the, encourages a culture where everyone really feels ownership of the product. And it's not something that, again, that is it, it's yours, not mine. So when we've integrated these things together, uh, these you know, DevX and Dev, uh, Dev into kind of the core uh, principles of DevOps, uh, organizations are gonna see a lot more cohesive, uh, agile, effective teams that are gonna be better equipped to meet a lot of these demands that we see of modern software development uh, and this big focus on developer productivity. Uh, yeah, uh, having a robust uh, Dev experience uh, fosters a, a, like I said, more integrated sorry, and efficient collaboration. Um, and there's no better example than what we've seen with platform engineering over the last few years. Uh, the rise of platform engineering really has, has given us uh, you know, um, co uh, comprehensive and integrated environments. Uh, we've kind of abstracted away the complexities of, of infrastructure uh, and a lot of the backend services. We've ensured that developers have access to the, the things that they need uh, in easy, easy to use fashion so that they can be more productive, uh, streamlining those processes, reducing uh, setup time and the developer toil, uh, which goes to you know, decrease uh, productivity. And so self-service platforms has come out of that as well, which we we're, we're already talked about, uh, bringing that you know, empowerment to developers, leveraging automation, templates, uh, predefined policies, putting in place all those guardrails so that somebody can be successful without having a lot of the challenges that we've had in the past around some of these, uh, giving access to some of these tools without filling out an IT ticket and such. Um, you're able to accelerate development, enhance productivity and all that with a self-service platform. Uh, so when we bring all of that together, um, we're ensuring that devs have access to the tools and processes that they need uh, to not only streamline their workflow, but also facilitate a smoother transition of code between teams and processes between teams. Um, and that goes to you know, enhance efficiency in, in those development uh, life cycles that we see um, in wanting higher quality outcomes and have better productivity. So uh, last couple things, some of the better practices when you think about what this looks like to have when you kind of want to try and level up your, your developer experience internally, uh, equip your teams, uh, make sure that they're um, integrated with uh, easy, friendly, uh, easy user-friendly tools supporting your automation collaboration, uh, put in place you know, cross-functional teams, make sure that roles from across the organization are available, uh, establish robust feedback, and automate repetitive manual tasks wherever possible. Um, yeah, we'll have a number of things around productivity. Uh, and then we see a lot of the stuff around morale. When you have better productivity there, uh, your developers are going to be more, more happy uh, and get better, quicker feedback and finish. So the last little thing here, DevX reflects an organization's value. If there is not a process in place for feedback within the organization, uh, then I really question you know, the company's to, um, dedication to having good developer experience. So. It's important there. Now, last bit, ruthlessly eliminating barriers and blockers that keep your developers from being successful. Keep that in mind and you'll have a good developer experience. That's it.